you know, something that we've talked about in the past um, that I think gets overlooked in listening instruction, because you, you, when you say explicit versus implicit, yeah, you know, you get the textbook for listening and it's like, okay, listen once, now listen a second time, now listen a third time, and each time you have kind of a different focus. But I think one area that we've talked about that gets left out is the metacognitive part where you're having students evaluate their own listening, evaluate how, how focused were they or how do they feel about what they heard? Um, are they, you know, and keeping track over time, like, do you feel like you're getting better? Do you feel like you're getting worse? You know, what situations do you listen to? Do you feel like you really get stuff out of listening journals, you know, things where you're raising your students awareness of their ability to understand. I think that that is not really in listening textbooks, <laughs> but it's so important. <laughs> it's not really in listening textbooks. We don't really have listening textbooks. We have note-taking textbooks. Yes, that's very true. Right, if you yeah. look at anything for academic English, it's all about listening and note-taking, listen to a mock lecture, what are the signposts, paraphrase, what were the main ideas of the lecture, what are a few supporting details, like, these are reading skills. These are reading and writing skills. And so part of the issue as well is that we've really privileged reading and writing as academics. So these are orthographic in nature, right? We can mm -hmm. see words when we read, we can see word boundaries. When we write, you know, we can control how we're communicating the letters and words on the page and the number of sentences in a paragraph. So I think a lot of TESOL instructors feel very confident in their ability to teach writing, right? Mm -hmm. It's also something we can easily evaluate. We can look at an essay and give feedback at the global level, the development or local level, or you need to look on word, at word choice or word form, check your grammar, verb tense, et cetera. But um, you're right. I think that there is something to the metacognition that really flies under the radar as well. And, and metacognition by definition is thinking about thinking. And this has a lot of different components to it. Um, so there are a lot of people like Vandergriff and Go 2012, they've done a lot on trying to get metacognition into the world of listening researchers. But again, if the students know, don't know that they should be tapping into their metacognition, that's probably a reflection. It's because the teachers don't know. <laughs> Yeah. about it. And it's still new. It's still new-ish, right? And so I think it's new enough that if you've been teaching for 15 years, you wouldn't have been trained in the metacognitive approach. Mm -hmm. But it's not the only approach. I mean, we have, we have kind of neutral to positive evidence for metacognitive approaches. We don't have enough research still addressing the metacognitive approach from a diverse student body like I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So most of the research we have so far comes from EFL where we have monolingual mm -hmm. um, speakers who are acquiring English as a second language together like in unison and they all might share the same language back first language background as their their teacher who's teaching them yep. which makes sense I mean that's just how things are in the world is that we tap into the local and what's available but again like we if you have a, um, a diverse student classroom you're going to have different ways of thinking about things. And so we need more research on this to see what strategies students have um, and how they're applying with from different linguistic backgrounds.